I want to preach a sermon entitled The Rule of the Mantle. The Rule of the Mantle. Mm, thank you, Lord Jesus. Verse 19. All right, let's begin verse 19. Second Kings chapter 19, verse 19. The Bible says, And so he departed thence and found Elisha. Who found Elisha? Elijah. The Bible says the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen before him. Praise the Lord. Now there is revelation there, although I cannot, some of you can't bear it now. But the reason as to why there were twelve, what? Yoke of oxen. You, you, if you understand the life of Elisha, you can understand the life of what some people call tapping the anointing. And it's not really the, 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 the language, but in the biggest line of picture, it's called tapping, but it's really not tapping. The Bible says, and so he departed thence and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plying with twelve yoke of oxen before him, and he with the twelve. And Elijah passed by and cast a mantle upon him. Verse 20. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, and then we'll follow thee. And he said unto him, Go back again. For what have I done to thee? Verse 21. And he returned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slew. What? Them and boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen and gave unto the people. And they did eat. And then he arose and went after Elijah and ministered unto him. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Give me the Amplified Bible of verse 20. And he left the oxen and after... Elijah said, let me kiss my father and mother, and then we'll follow you. And he, testing Elisha, said, go on back. What have I done to you? That's what I was looking for. He testing. Told him, go on back. What have I done to you? It was a test. It wasn't approval. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me begin this way. When men don't know what has been done to them, <laughs> they do certain things because they know not what was done to them. Praise the Lord Jesus. And that's why the ardent question to Elisha was, what have I done to you? What have I done to you? What have I done to you? You go back. What have I done to you? Now, open-ended question means I've put something in your spirit, Elisha, but it seems you don't get it. Go back. Go and say bye to your parents. Now, if Elisha had gone, let me tell you something. By the time he would come back, <laughs> the man of God will have left. And that should have been it. Why? This guy, listen. This guy, look at, look at the picture. He's from an experience of God teaching him better. Okay? There was a time he thought he was the only prophet. You, you see where Elijah is coming. Elijah is coming from. Elijah is coming from the angle of thinking he's the only prophet. For the Baal Jezebel has killed all your prophets in the land. I am this. Look at me. Look at that. And then hey, the Lord tells Elijah, no, Elijah. That's, if, if you go back to the verses before, you realize that. Okay? He runs away from Ahab to preserve the only prophet there was in Israel. Okay? When he goes to run away, the Lord tells this guy both, I have 7,000 men that have not bowed there. There what? Verse 12, verse 18, I think. Hey, yet I will leave 7,000 of Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Okay? God is telling this guy, you're not the only fish in the pond. Okay? You're not the only minister there is. There is not only one your kind. You're unique, it's wonderful, but there is another kind of yours. So, Elijah comes with that understanding that, oh, oh, God has slapped his theology. He thought he was the only man there was. Are you hearing me? 
Then the Lord revealed to him, I have left me 7,000 men who have not bowed their heads to and to bow and every mouth which has not kissed him. There were 7,000 guys somewhere in the world. But Elijah did not know. Yet he was a prophet. And that's the thing many prophets don't understand. They think they know everything because they're prophets. No, sir. No, sir. If it was so, prophets would be the deepest teachers. Because these mysteries are also stumbled upon in the spirit. You understand what I'm trying to say? But if you find a prophet who can see what you ate last week, can see what you dreamt last year, but they cannot even mention any mystery. Yet they are prophets. You see where I'm coming from? Yet they are what? They are prophets. But the guy cannot even tell one line of the spirit. But he's a what? He's a prophet. Now let me tell you, even the teacher, even though he's not prophesying, he doesn't dig those things from near. You get around to tell it? Because the Bible says there's no scripture of private interpretation. But as the men spake, even as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And that is why many prophets don't understand when they find that they can know what you ate and what you drank, but they cannot be moved in that direction. And that's why I always tell you that teachers should judge the prophet. Because that's a move in a certain direction. Prophets don't see. So if you find a prophet who is a teacher, okay, reading that they are a teacher, they're not just borrowing lines of some books. That's good. That's very good. It's expedient. Usually such men judge themselves quicker. And they are vast from evil. Before it comes. Are you hearing me? Praise the Lord Jesus. So, there is something that I've seen that Elijah has not seen. And this is very simple. God has 7,000 guys. What was Elijah hearing? Not to hear that. Yet he was a prophet. Are you hearing me? But 7,000 men have not bowed their heads to bow. So Elijah, humbly learning from the Lord, he realizes there's a 7,000. But even though they existed, they were not of Elijah's spirit. You get on to tell you? They could not contend enough to catch the attention of the house or Jezebel. And that is why I tell Christians, many Christians, if you are still in ministry and you have not yet been persecuted, question your salvation. If you're loved by everybody, if you're favored by everybody, if you're bold gold by everybody, question your submission. Because at a particular point, I was sharing with somebody today who was troubled about persecution. I told them, the moment glory rests upon you, you'll be persecuted. That's how you know that the glory of God rests upon you. In fact, I'll preach a sermon on persecution tomorrow. Should I? May I? So that I can prepare you enough. Yeah? Should I preach about it? Okay, I think it's right. I'll preach about persecution tomorrow. I'll show you exactly how to handle the spirit. I'll show you the spirit behind persecution. Praise the Lord Jesus. And how you ought to do. Because you see, like, I was reading a scripture, and, and the scripture is saying, for the evil men and seducers shall grow or wax worse and worse. Okay? I mean, even if you do what, some people will never change their opinion about you until you die. Okay? Even if you do everything they want until you enter their books, they, it will, you'll never change their opinion. But tomorrow, persecution. Tell your neighbor, persecution tomorrow. Okay? Hallelujah. And I want to show you how to thrive in it, and how to grow in it, and how to increase in it. Praise the Lord. Even amid this persecution, you'll just go up and up and up and up. Now, I'm not talking of when you do wrong, eh? How you are saying it? Eh? Oh, for me, I'm not in persecution. Yeah, I'm persecuted. Why did you abuse your friend? I'm not talking about that kind of persecution. Praise the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. But there was a reason as to why there were 7,000 men who were not bowing the bow. That also did not catch the attention of Jezebel. Okay? The Lord had kept them. Now, the Lord keeping them doesn't mean that they were, hey, they were, <laughs> they were better than Elijah. That's why we don't know their names. 
and he's in the book of Kings. Praise the Lord. It does not necessarily mean that because they were kept away from danger, therefore, no, God was just correcting the man. There are 7,000 men, that's all. He didn't say better than you. In fact, God's problem with Elijah was not him thinking he's alone. God's problem with Elijah all through was simple. What are you doing here? He didn't expect Elijah to be in the cave. Why? He was enjoying the fireworks. Listen, the very anointing that calls fire from heaven, can stand in front of thousands of armies and just and burn all them horses. So Elijah finished the movie earlier than Jesus and God wanted. That was God's problem, really. What are you doing here? So God's problem with Elijah was being displaced. Are you hearing me? But that's for another day. Praise the Lord. That's for another day. Back to the point. When the Lord reveals to Elijah in 1 Kings 19.18 that they are 7,000 men who have not bowed their heads to bow, Elijah realizes I can only reproduce myself in some of those men. You get it? I can only reproduce myself in some of those men. Now, then do we realize that Elisha was a monk? <laughs> Elisha was always a monk. He was hid. So the scriptures tell us, the moment he comes from the Lord's lecture, the Bible says he carries a mantle. He first finds the first prophet. He casts the mantle on him. And then walks away. When he walks away, Elisha is like, oh, oh, son of shepherd. This guy has cast his mantle on me. He follows. But he runs to the guy and tells him, wait, I want to go and tell my parents. Amplified again, verse 20. He says, let me run to my parents and tell them that. Kiss them goodbye. Let me go to my father and kiss him. And mother, and then I kiss them goodbye and I'll follow you. And the Bible says, and he, Elijah, testing Elisha, said, go back on. What have I done to you? Settle it for yourself. Go back on. But he's testing to see whether the boy knows what has been done to him or not. What did he do? He went to the things he was looking after and then cooked them, cut them, sliced them, gave them out and then followed the man of God. Why? Because if Elisha had actually thought that this was an instruction, he would not have ended the way he ended. The irony of this is, in fact, to the back of the mind, the man of God casting a mantle on Elisha is telling him how, you see, he's telling him, go on your way for what have I done to you? But in actual sense, for a mind of the spirit, you understand? He's sarcastic. The truth is I've put something on you that can't take you back to your father and mother. It just can't take you back to your father and mother. I mean, it just can't take you back to your home the way you have been going back. It can't make you dress the same way you've been dressing. It can't make you pray a certain way. It can't make you act the way you've been acting. A certain course in your life has changed the moment the mantle fell on you. Hallelujah. But all oh, Elisha did not know what was done to him. And that's where I begin from. Many people don't know what was cast upon them. They don't know what was cast. C-A-S-T. What was put upon them. And that's why they still have moments of going back to mother and kissing them goodbye. And unfortunately, when you're a man of the spirit, you don't do it intentionally to tell them, go back, for what have I done to you? But you're testing their spirit to know whether they know what they have received. And then the dear person can go, and then they find you've gone, and then they say, but you told me, I asked you, should I go? And you told me, go. So I went, I was obeying your voice. Sister, the man was testing you. The man of God was just testing your spirit to know whether you'd do so. You see, to Elijah, the problem is not that the boy has asked for, for permission to go and kiss his mother and father. To Elijah, he's surprised that the boy can even ask after what he has cast upon him. Do you remember him go back to the Tishbite line when the Lord calls and anoints him? 
when the Lord pulls him out of the Tishbite, he has understood, he has left the Tishbite line. He cannot go back to the Tishbite line. All his life now he has to kill. You see, the mandate on Elijah is deeper than a prophet, and that's why he's found in the book of Kings. He should have had his own book like Nehemiah, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Zephaniah. He should have had his own book. But why has the Lord hidden him in the Kings? There was a mantle special on Elijah that many kings, many prophets did not have. And that is why you go back to the Old Testament. You seldom find prophets doing the miraculous. But Elijah, crazy. Elisha, crazy. Why? Because in the book of Kings, they have a prophetic kingly on them. They have a prophetic kingly anointing on them. They're not just prophets, but they're prophets who can demonstrate. You read Jeremiah, you don't see much demonstration or any. You read Isaiah, same thing. You read Ezekiel, same thing. You read Zechariah, same thing. You read Haggai, same thing. You read the Major and the Minors. Many of these guys are just speaking of a future life. But when you're with Elijah, you're, you're demonstrating. When you're with Elijah, you, you, you're separating water, you're sending fire from up. When you're in Elisha, you're floating axes and training the, the, the faith and, and, and taste of water. You, 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 you understand? You're casting guys and bears and mauling them in seconds. You get, that's the kind of anointing on these guys. They have a kingly prophetic. It can execute the anointing, but it also sees the future. Are you hearing me? Now, he's a man of his own right who single-handedly breaks the whole line of Ahab and Jezebel down to the square. He bound hundreds of Baal prophets by the anointing upon him. That's how anointed the guy was. Elijah was, he was not a normal, simple guy. No, he was, a, I mean, he, this man could get to a point and even get bored and say, at the sound of my mention, it shall not rain for three years. Not that that says the Lord. He's even not speaking it. Eh? Eh? Frail, frail, in line with, with what he has seen. You know, it's one thing to say, I saw the Lord, you know, stop the rain. So, it stopped. No, he says, at my sound, at my word. I stop the rain. I'm free as it stops. You understand? Whether Bo, I don't know, God has to think of feeding the prophet. Because even though he has stopped the rain, he is too anointed not to feed. And the next thing we know, God is sending ravens to feed the guy. Why? Because he is that important in the gospel. He is that important. He is that anointed. You understand? He, cannot, he goes to a household of a widow. You understand? And, and he can eat anything he wants because he knows he can produce more. He has that independence on his spirit. He can speak and say that the anointing shall not leave your household. And whether you want it or not, it shall not leave your household. He has a blessing or can bless, and that's it. It doesn't matter how much witchcraft is on you. It doesn't, listen, so when that man goes to a widow, and all she has is this simple full meal for her to eat and her son die, and he tells her, give it to me, she has no choice. She's giving a guy who has the ability to reproduce it. Now you find men who don't even have ability to reproduce also beg. Also use that portion of scripture. As some of you have understood what I've said. They don't even have the ability to cause a blessing on you. They don't have the ability to cause a blessing to settle on you, to rest on you. The word for settling is actually inhabit. They cannot cause a blessing to inhabit your territory. They cannot. They don't have the ability to direct the winds to blow your ends. They do not. But they also borrow that portion of scripture. And say, oh the widow, oh the widow, oh the widow. Why don't you call them when the widow loses a child? Because they don't have the anointing raiser. It's too big a faith. They just come to bury the child. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But the anointing we're talking about here when, when, the, when, any, when, when you lose a child, they can raise it. Because that's the kind of anointing we're talking about here. We're not talking about any normal anointing. We're talking about something more serious than you think. Are you hearing me? Do you understand where I'm coming from? Simple instruction. When the mantle was placed on Elisha, the rule of the farm was actually follow me. Now, let's go a bit deeper. The Hebrew word for mantle is a beret. A beret is directly translated as glory or magnificence. Okay? So when he casts his mantle on Elisha, he's saying you're a prophet, but I've cast something on my life on you. What made Elijah more brilliant than the other guys who are 7,000, even more hidden? You understand? You see, 
You must understand the guy I'm talking about. When he's taken up by glory, you understand? By the horses. God even refused the guy to die. He refused the guy to see death. He was that anointed. He refused Elijah to see corruption. He was that anointed. He was that anointed. He was that anointed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When he goes up, what does the statement Elisha say? He says, the chariot of Israel is gone. The army, the word there is army. He says, the, the army of Israel has gone. That means Elijah was the army of Israel. Israel did not have an army without Elijah. I mean, I'm talking of an anointing of one guy. Now, when the Bible says Elijah was a man of like passions, understand which passions the Lord defines. They're more crazier than some of you think. You get what I'm trying to tell you? Hallelujah. That kind of anointing. That kind of anointing. That kind of anointing was on this man. So when the man says he's a chariot of Israel, it means he is worth the army. You don't need a million people to guard Israel. You just need Elijah. Meaning, there is something on Elijah that can cause anything surrounding Israel to be destroyed by just a speech. One word like this. That's dangerous. That's dangerous. Elijah could speak to a territory and it's arrested because he can deny you water <laughs> and he can send you fire. He's that crazy. He's that anointed. He controls the elements. He controls the elements. He can cut your cross and it dies by the word of his mouth. And you don't even get one yield because it's an anointing on Elijah. It's on him. Now there are 7,000 years, but they are hidden. Well, he's just I wish these 7,000 also stopped rain. I wish they also stopped the sun high. I wish they also brought water and in and, 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 and raised dead people. But they did not. There were just 7,000 hidden guys. We don't even know their name, but there are 7,000. That was the thing on Elijah. And then he realizes, okay, even though these guys are prophets, I want to get somebody in my own line. I, I want to get something my, that, that understands this kind of course. Yes, they are prophets, but yes, but I want to get a certain kind of prophet. They are teachers, but I want to get a certain kind of teacher. They are preachers, but I want to get a certain kind of preacher. They are worshippers, but I want to get a certain kind of worshipper. And this thing can only be cast in a mother mantle on the child. The child says, oh, let me go back and kiss mother. Let me go back and kiss father. Oh, they did not understand it. Ha! Ah, what have I done to you? It's very easy. Go back. Go kiss them. Go kiss them. And then you walk, and the next thing they know is, they start to ask questions. How come I am hearing this message, but it's not happening in my life? You went back and kissed your mother. While the other one slaughtered, slaughtered their oxen. And listen, this was what was valuable. He was doing a shepherd line. Are you hearing me? He was looking after animals, but when the mantle was cast upon him, he burnt it like it was useless. Whatever he was looking after, he ignored and put away. And while he put that nonsense away, for you, you went back and kissed your mother and father. By the time you come from mother and father, oh, you don't understand kissing mothers and fathers, do you? No, you do not. You do not. Some people ought to know what was placed upon their lives. You must know. There's a reason as to why the hand was laid upon you that day. There's a reason as to why they spoke upon your life and said, you are a prophet. Why aren't you prophesying? You kissed your mother. You went back to kiss your mother. You went back. You don't know what they did to you. And then you find a funny guy saying, I'm an apostle. I'm an apostle. He prays when he wants. He fasts when he wants. When he doesn't want to fast, he dies. I'm an apostle. Listen, why are you apostolizing? Oh, I'm a prophet. Oh, the Lord calls me. I'm a prophet. When I pray, I rain pray. I'm a prophet. And it's true whether you pray or you don't, you're a prophet. But there were 7,000 and not all of them are written about. We don't know their names. They died prophets. Try to understand it. You get what I'm trying to tell you? You take the gospel a bit more sensitive and more serious about your life. 
You're stealing little small picky picky things of little children. Oh, even in sin, Father Papa Sam, he spoke to me badly. I'm not going to come and sing because Papa Sam spoke to me badly. Can you believe he spoke to me badly? That's kissing your mother and father. You don't know what was done to you. You don't know what was done to you. The guy is denied three times. Don't follow me. I, I, I think, I think if Elisha had not understood this, he would have said, the prophet refused me to follow him. He's so bad. Okay, me I'll sit here. Even me, God will come from somewhere and anoint me. Listen, you don't understand what was done you. When he says go back, listen, pass to him. Why? Because there's something that was cast upon your life. When the Lord told me, go and submit to a pastor, I, said, I entered ministry of what? I don't know what to call it. Bureau of Statistics. She looked at me and said, you've been calling me for so long. What do you want? You understand? I told him, sir, I need to talk to you about something. He just walked away like this and told me, talk. <laughs> In my head, I'm like, look at this proud man. But you see, my years of meeting Pastor Isaiah in campus was very simple. When I was at campus, he spoke something upon my life. When he said, I pray that a boy be anointed three times more than me, he laid hands on me and told his God that I should be three times anointed than him. I understood what was cast upon me. I understood it. So years later when I graduate, he's all in his own line. Dear man, he has left this city doing his own business. The Lord told me, go and look back for your man. Look for that man. Because there is something he saw upon your life when nobody saw it. So I go looking for this man. Why? Because he cast something upon my life. So I tell him, oh, and I'm here, sir. Uh, he tells me, what do you want? He says, uh, he just, just walks away. Just, you know, a person just walking away. And then he said, but how proud? He, this cannot be your father. How can he do this business to me? You understand? How can he just ignore me? If I call Apostle Grace, he doesn't answer my call. I'm not even going to pray. I'm just not going to church. I'm not even going to send him WhatsApp. How can I send him WhatsApp and he doesn't answer me? You don't know what was done to you. You don't know. <laughs> and you know what? When you say, I'm just going to pray, he will test your spirit and say, don't pray. <laughs> Until you, <laughs> until you're okay, you, you understand. Ah, let me preach to the choir. <laughs> you get where I'm coming from. So he just walked. I said, "Sir, I, I, I talk. Speak quickly." Pastor, I said, "Speak." Hmm. 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 So, sir, I have seen your ministry. I have been blessed by your ministry. <laughs> when I look at you, I feel like I want to be like you. So, hey, hello, Oliwa. Huh? Oja, Wenja. Bye. So you are saying, oh, he, he reached his super custom. The Lord is my witness. He opened the door, just got in and locked. Wow. I just had to think that he's telling me also end. <laughs> in super custom. Wow. He said, have you finished speaking? I told him, no. Please, can we conclude this? A few seconds. I told him, I want to submit to this. He looked at me like, hmm. you want to submit to me? I told him, yeah. Hmm. Are you married? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was the first question he asked me. I told him, no, sir. <laughs> told me, get married. Get now, <laughs> so you can see how long he has been on my case. <laughs> it's not like yesterday. So you see how serious this is. I, I want to tell him, you see, sir, <laughs> I am a young guy. I've just graduated. I don't have a bed. <laughs> but he doesn't understand. <laughs> He's asking me, are you married? <laughs> no, get married. <laughs> I'm like, get married. Get married. I just graduated, fresh graduate. Praise the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord Jesus. I, ran, I reminded him something. 
I told him, I'm the last guy you saw. What? The last time I began to this is what happened. A certain great man of God um, um, uh, uh, had started a meeting somewhere in Buganda Road Primary, and he asked me to be starting program. There were some of you do programs. Visitors come. Visitors, yeah, 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 You're welcome to have a ministry. Have you got a new name? That's what even me, I was doing for a certain man of God. A certain man of God. Is that what? Man of God. So the man of God invites Pastor Isaiah, and that day when he carries his wife. And look at how disrespectful this was. The day Pastor Isaiah had come to minister, in the place the man of God had rented, the man of God forgot that he had invited Pastor Isaiah on his meeting. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me? Those are the men I used to serve then. Are you hearing me? And this was the second meeting. The first meeting we were three. The second meeting he says, he calls me at once and says, ay, 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 Grace, where are you? I tell him I'm, I'm working. He says, ay, 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 I invited Pastor Isaiah to come for the meeting. And then, He's welcome. He says, no, no, you don't understand. I'm not there, and I don't know anyone there. And even the person we met with last week is not there, so you're the only person to welcome him. Run and welcome Apostle Isaiah and take him to the room where we are going to pray from. Empty room. <laughs> yes, sir. I canceled my, I don't know that day who I disappointed, but I canceled everything. I just got on a board. A boy. We were on the road, I reached there. I find Pastor Isaiah and his car like this. His mama Deborah and Buga. They're all standing there waiting for a certain room. I'm going to take them. <laughs> and then the man of I tell the man of God, but there's no one here, you're not here. He told me, find something to tell them. Who? <laughs> so how is ministry? <laughs> ah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Loving, we loving the Lord. <laughs> the thing is wonderful. Uh, so I'm Apostle Grace. Oh yeah, and I'm, I'm the one who used to hang out with the other guys. You guys, yeah, I'm the one. <sighs> anyway, so where is the room? Can we go? Uh, <sighs> Actually, there is no one. He says, "What?" There's no one. God is standing. You mean I just drove my fuel? <laughs> For no one. Yo, yo, yo. I said, yeah. <laughs> Are you guys serious? I said, yeah. You tell me you guys are not serious. You wasted my time. I told the man of God, sir, I am sorry. I was not even the one who called him. But I went into apology line and said, sir, I am sorry. He told me, no, don't worry. So that was the last. So when I come to submit, that's the first he sees. <laughs> oh, 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 I'm serious guy who called him on a no empty room and he drove his fuel, he didn't even hear him anything. And then he drove away. That is the guy who has come to. <laughs> but I needed him. He didn't need me. You get it? I needed him. At least I was humble to know I needed him. Praise the Lord. And then after that, Start to serve him and serve him and serve him. I catch his attention. We go with Michael to preach somewhere there. He hears how I preach. He likes me. Calls me second time. We start going to ministry together. And 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 that's how the submission, father-son relationship begins. And I tell him, Papa, me, when we go together for ministry, I can't speak on the pulpit before you. 
So these things you see Pastor Isaiah preaching before, it's not just he's preaching before, no. There is a mind behind, I hate speaking before my father. I just don't do it. I hate it. That's why when we go somewhere else, he has to speak before. He knows it. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. He what? He knows that when we have a preaching engagement, he comes first. Not because he can't. You know that even those times he'd come in, preach and demonstrate, I don't even know where to start from because he has already messed up the room, but he's my father. I don't speak before him. He's the head. You get him around it, you? And the working relationship and submission has been fine. He's far. He was supposed to be in Hong Kong and China longer than that. But because Fanero is beginning on 7th and he must first speak, he has to come back early. You get what I'm He could not miss even the world. Period. Now, I imagine I was like some people. He has ignored me. This is not my kind of man of God. How can he ignore me? How can he speak to me that way? Maybe he's mature enough to test your spirit. Maybe he's mature enough to test your spirit to see whether you are be taken by a certain line of ignorance and immaturity, or you respond like a child. Because the Bible says that he that does not stand chastisement is not a son, hence a bastard. They are not your child if they can't listen to you. They are not your child if they can carry a long face because you're chastising them. They are not your child if you speak to them a certain way and then they get angry, they start to treat you a certain way. That's not your child. Your child comes back. You ask this guy how much I've, made, I've dealt with him, this guy, or him. When I talk to them, I talk to them so tough. You get on right to say, and after roasting them, they come back and sit like nothing happened, and we make our, also, am I in the house? Come the last time, I was, <laughs> I was calilaring him. That is a son. He knows I cannot speak outside love. He knows that. Why? Because even when he did the silliest mistake in the world, I still trusted him with my glory. What was entity to me that we have invited the Apostle Grace? I told him, another man is coming in my stead. I cast my mantle on him. You get what I'm trying to say? I would have said, no, 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 no. He annoyed me last week. Let me not cast it on him. Let me send another one. No, I always sent him because he's my sin. Whether I'm annoyed of him or not, he's my son. You get it? These are the small instances. The boy can misapprehend. You understand? But he's still yours. You get it? And he's still your father. He doesn't change. If he's not, go look for another one. Who may will make you comfortable. Praise the Lord Jesus. And sometimes the response, because was put upon you. I was telling Christians the other day, I don't ask everyone where they are. There, but there are some of you I have had fights with. Pass or no? Where have you been? But there are some people who may pray and I say, hey, Bambi, thank you for coming. And there are some who don't pray and they say, hmm, that's funny. Some of them, it's okay. Maybe I didn't put something on them. Or they are not mine, they are somebody else's person. They owe their responsibilities and accountability elsewhere. But when I start looking for you, you know there was something that was put on you. Are you hearing me? You know that there was what? Something put upon your life. Something put upon your life. There is something on you. There is just something on you. You're not a number. You're not a number. There were 7,000 men, but there's reason why this mantle was cast on Elisha and not anybody else. And before we know it, it was not just a cloth. We go to 2 Kings 2.8. The guy gets to the water after denying the boy three times. He gets to Jordan with a very mantle and glory. Damn, separates it. And once they cross the other side, he asks the boy, what should I give you? What do you want? You ask for what you want. Because the anointing on Elijah could relieve anything on Elijah. And, and, and look at how serious this is. When he asks Elijah, what do you want? He means he can get anything he wants. Because he has followed the rules. He can get anything he wants. Yes, he can even get more than Elijah. 
So he tells, I want a double portion of your spirit. He says, if you see me, go. The guy goes, and the next thing we know, 2 Kings 2.14, he carries the same mantle. And then he goes to the water and says, where is the Lord God of Elijah? He didn't say, where is my God? No, no. At that particular point, it wasn't his God. At that particular point, it was the God of the man who he saw go ahead of him. It was, the, it was the mantle of the man who he saw do the kinds of things he will want to do. It was the mantle of the man who he saw walk a certain way he would want to walk, preach a certain way he wanted to preach, worship a certain way he wanted to worship, serve a certain way he wanted to serve. It was that kind of mantle. The Lord God of that man. Bam! Slams the same mantle. And what? The waters, part. the waters are not parting because Elisha has faith. But because he carries a certain man's glory. Then he crosses over. That point, he starts his ministry. Splits the mantle twice. The double portion starts to work in his spirit and life. And from then on, he does all these kinds of miracles. And then he realized Elijah was actually badder <laughs> than Elijah. If that word exists, are you hearing me? <laughs> I mean, how can a man die? And, 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 and the next thing we know, even his bones, just, they say they got a dead man from battle and just threw the bones on, on Elijah's bones, Elijah's bones. Bam! And the Bible says, among the body, touched the bones of Elijah. <laughs> it flew to life. Then there was Zoe in the bones. <laughs> dead bones, they were dead and they're there. Are you hearing me? But if a man dead could touch it, there was a, there is no body, no flesh that could touch those kinds of bones and still what? Be dead. I'm talking of that kind of anointing that goes through even to the bones. Because that's the last line of settling. And that is why when men die, this mama says, you go through the scriptures, they carry the bones of Jesus. They carry the bones of Daniel. They are carrying the bones and putting them back in a certain place. They are carrying those bones and they are putting them in the place where they inherit. Why? Because they know the last line of them bones is the anointing. That's why even with Christ, beaten in all these kinds of things, he says none of his bones was broken. They could not break a particular line of the anointing. Yes, you can deal with him everywhere you want, but oh, you know, oh, my no man, now this you can beat for the flesh. Nothing, nothing in this life can be substituted to atone for bones. Bones don't atone. Bones give life. Because on the bones, there is no line of judgment. The anointing is too concentrated to judge. So the man killed, we don't know whether he had actually slept with a prostitute the night before or not. The dead body just starch bones. And in that level of the anointing, judgment or not, it just has to get a certain answer. You don't understand what I'm trying to say. If it was in the flesh, it denied, it deserved the certain judgment. It says that no flesh can glory by the because flesh has a line of judgment. But when you get to the bones, there's no judgment. It's just a deep sitting line of the anointing. Because it's the only substance that formeth in the womb of a woman by mystery. Even the man reads it in the Bible and says, Oh, how does the bones form up in the womb of a woman? How does bone get into flesh? Uterus. How? Yet it began as a sperm. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me? And it goes forming and forming and forming into this thing. And before you know it, that hard thing comes out. You need enough anointing to form it. You need enough anointing to form it. So th when this kind of man dies, his bones have to raise. He has to do double. You see, double the man's spirit is more than even just being double. You understand? <laughs> it was an apprehension of a higher level and an improved line of Elijah. But imagine when the mantle was cast. Imagine if when the mantle was cast, he went to kiss his mother. He went to attend to certain things that seemed were important but were not spiritual in the line of the prophet. It's okay to kiss your mother, but brother, while you were prophesying, we found you doing what? Attending oxen. It wasn't your primary ministry. You are taking on a responsibility that is way bigger than just looking after 12 animals. 
The guy who cuts the mantle has nations in his hands. He is an army in the nation. Okay, listen, if you want to go back and say bye to mama and then the guy has gone, you'll still come back and seek after your life and look after your animals and die as a prophet who looked after animals, but separate permissible and perfect. Separate that. Separate what is acceptable and what is beneficial. Separate precious and what is vile. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Today I was driving to church and I found a church member driving back. Driving back. In my head I'm thinking, what is this church member going to do at home? At five. You get what I'm saying? They don't even have the mind to say, Papa, I'm going to be away. So how can you not even explain your abstention? Except you don't know what was done to you. I found someone going back home at 5, 5 p.m. They are going back home. They don't even have the responsibility to say, Oh, Papa, this has happened. I'm sorry, I'm not going to attend service. Oh, so your father should know that you actually care for what was put on you. But some people don't even care for what was put upon them. They pray when they want to pray. They come when they want to come. When they don't want to come, they don't come. Even in the times when they have the ability to come, they will force a certain life to tell them they couldn't. I told people the other day I was touched when I bumped into a church member who was walking from Kampala. I wept. And I was not weeping because I was touched by what she did. I was weeping because I was asking God, what does this woman want from you that another one who has a car can't want? and transport. I was asking myself, how can both of them be taken of the same meat and same milk and you cast mantles on both of them and one has walked from Kampala. She's an educated person. She has a degree bachelor's and she is walking with dust on her feet. Why? She has come to pray. She has come to pray. And that's what came to my spirit. I said, God, how be it that this person can be like this and another one who has transport fails to make it or even has a car or could have even created time just wakes up and says, ah, papa, papa, I'm not going to make it and you go take to the simple lines and then you realize actually what kept them home was not beneficial and then after that boldly the guy says I am tired of living a certain life I pray, I fast, I do all these kinds of things I believe that it's not working in my life really, it's not working you're kissing mother you're kissing your father. How do you expect to get those results? I told people, you think we don't have family? We do have family. You think we don't have weddings to attend? We have a million of them. That day somebody came to me and they attended the wedding. You understand? Left it in the middle, came for service, and after that went back to finish reception. And then another one even disappears and never comes back because I'm not wedding. They don't even notice that you're there. Even the cloth you're putting on, it's borrowed. You're that broke. We are going for a wedding. You see. All the way we are going to say, we are going to go to the wedding. We are going to go to But the makeup, even the mascara you're putting on, everything is not yours. They go to weddings and borrow perfumes and all of them smell the same. Bro. Do you love me? Do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. <laughs> Are you hearing me? So then I ask myself a question. How about this Christian I see every Monday, every Tuesday, every Wednesday, every Thursday? Is she less busy? And I start to realize that even some people who are attending these services consistently are working. They leave work with their tired minds. The Elizabeths are working. They work. The faiths work every day. The persons work every day. And you find a person who doesn't even have a job. And they're not praying. Now, what do you want from God? Do you even know what's upon you? You think, I was telling people the other day, when we started ministry, with all the people we started with, we are not at the same level now. Some have, have hit shipwreck. 
Some are disappointed. I found one that spent many years across the world. She was in a certain nation. She has come back the same way, slightly bigger. Same way. I said, God. 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 How can a child of God be comfortable at their level enough not to want? And somebody doesn't even have the wisdom to say, okay, I missed this summer. Let me go look for this CD by choice. They don't know what was cast upon them. They just don't know. Are you hearing me? Now, when you test them, they won't see love. They'll see who gets together. They'll see over speaking on. You understand? One time I wrote to a dear guy who was a strategist attending church and everything. He started being funny. Not really attendance, it was something else. I sent a message, I told him, you know what, man? Take heed of your life. So pastor said, who is he to speak to me that way? He told me, Mr. Cleveland, to a cool bagam. A few days later, he hit shipwreck so badly. And when he knocked very well, he sent me a WhatsApp saying, I saw a fish to answer. Let him handle his business. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me? Let him handle his business. I was too young to speak to him. Who are you to speak to me? And that's what they said. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That day I released him and said, you know what? Go submit under a man who you can listen to. I wish you success. I released him rooms in good faith again. That's submitting it. You'll get it watch you. Are you hearing me? Why did I ask himself? Why did I send him a message? Why? I should have done something else. Praise the Lord Jesus. Sorry. I should have done something else with my time. Sorry. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I want to finish. So, some people pray the way they pray because they don't know what was put upon them. Some people fast the way they fast because they don't know what was put upon them. Some people respond the way they responded because they don't know what was put upon them. Let me tell you a secret with an apostolic heart. Are you hearing me? Let me speak from an apostolic point of view. My mandate in your life is to reproduce myself in you and pray you do better. That's all. I don't seek your money. I don't seek your clothes. I don't seek your shoes. No. Consider, like Second Timothy 3.14 says, every word that has been spoken of you, knowing from whom you have learned. The people you learn from are not seeking money from you. They're not seeking favor from you. They're not seeking advantage from you. They do not lose when you walk out. Another will walk in. Don't get me wrong here. We didn't start yesterday. And more faces, when you see a first time visitors, what does that tell you? Those are faces coming every other day. And you can be rubbed out, and tomorrow you're not a number anymore. But it's painful to every spirit of a father who realizes that he must reproduce himself. It's painful when I see this apostle, I told that you're apostolic, I laid hands on, and I said you're apostolic, and they're still in the same old sack of life. They're not advancing anywhere. I can't trust them for anything. I can't even move them to anything. I can't. I can't. Why? Because they're still kissing people. They're still kissing their mothers and fathers. They are comfortable turning over oxen. Are you hearing me? If we are not reproducing ourselves in you, what are we doing? Do you think we're comfortable? Do you think we find it comfortable sitting in this chair and after every time preaching and you're doing nothing? Look at us. Look at Michael. Look at Emma. Look at the Peter. Every guy, one of these guys who you see, who have started to see, come into the mix, and they're reproducing up the certain kind, the modestas and who. They just didn't wake up tomorrow and they were. But we had to produce something in our spirit. And they had to respond. They know what was done then. They know what was done then. But some of you, you don't know what was done. You think we just laid hands on you for you to fall down, get a big daddy and go back with your old heart. You can old bag and then you go back home and then come back the next morning and they lay hands on you. And then you fall down and then you see a Christian. You give him a simple instruction and he cannot listen. One instruction. He cannot listen. 
We've made mistakes in the gospel. We wish we didn't make them. We pray we did. We pray we did. But we made those mistakes. And some God realized these mistakes. And then I see a little guy going there and I'm telling him, brother, don't go that way. And he refuses. And before I know it, he's knocking walls. And after knocking walls, he's saying, this message is not working for me. Why isn't it working for you? You don't know what was cast upon you. Even in the test stations of a father proving his authority over his son and daughter, you could not match the first line. When I told you to attend this service, you went behind my back and said, how can you speak to me this way? Your father. Your father. But I can't tell him that and then he talks to me that way. He cannot. He cannot. Because he knows I do not work for myself. We are not preaching here for ourselves. When I left my family many years ago, weeks ago, months ago, and my mother calls me, where are you? When they look for me because I'm everywhere on Saturday and Sunday preaching to you, don't think I don't miss my mother. I miss my mother. But I'm here every Saturday for your sake. We're here every Sunday for your sake. We're with you on public holiday for your sake. In the Easter holiday, we're in Massachusetts for your own your sake. When you fall sick, we're the first people you call. When you're hurting, we're the first people you call. When you're going through situations, we're the first people you call. When you get up and your marriage is under failing, or your relationships are working out of life, we're the first people you call. You don't call anyone. You call us with a midnight or day or during night or day. You don't even understand the simple principle. Instruction. Instruction. It's only the son that can see his child another level of their backing. So when the man of God says, Ephraim is bread half-baked, he knows that you're half-baked. You've not even understood the simple lines of ministry. And you're already saying, oh, Papa, the Lord has told me, I'm going to start a ministry. And some of them to test and say, okay, go. But what does he know? What does he know? What does he know? What does he know? They help the project. It's the papers they've written with their vision. They... They cannot. Listen, these are lives of people you're taking responsibility for. These are lives. That's what I was telling you the other day. A guy just joins the church in the morning and then they can come and say, I want to submit to you, spiritual father. I'm a spiritual father. Who are you fathering? What do you mean by fathering? Look at the necessities of deacons. Not even fathers in the gospel. Look at the necessities of deacons. They say he must behold the doctrine of Christ in a pure conscience. Do you even know conscience? Do you even understand the doctrine? You just know the grace message and faith. You prayed a few things and cut them out. And then you think you have the authority to father. You. Spiritual father. Spiritual mother. Mama. 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 Dad, I was here in a group of Sambu kids going for a meeting. Ask them, are you going? Oh, we're going to pray. We have a certain meeting. Someone has started a meeting in the church. The last time I look into my record, this person doesn't even attend service. And I'm thinking, where are these beans going? To teach them what? To teach them what? To teach them what? We're starting a fellowship. How do they start a fellowship? Do you just wake up and get a bunch of people who are on fire? <laughs> just for an excitement. Oh, the word, the word, uh, I mean the word. He said, okay, let's sit down. Yes, yeah. He's this, uh, mystery, Greek, Hebrew. And then the real life situations come in their life and they cannot sort one thing. One thing. Something can happen in that meeting and the parents come looking and then they find this little small thing. But who is the pastor? <laughs> Spiritual father. You can't, even when they put you before the council, you can't speak wisdom. You can't speak wisdom. But you're rushing. You're rushing. That's why sometimes I scorn at people who share certain messages on WhatsApp. They are not mature to even teach their teaching. You, you look at the person sharing a message and you compare their lives and you say, do they even behold the doctrine with a pure conscience? Their conscience is already defiled by an indifference, by level of immaturity. They are a novice. That simple line they've sent on WhatsApp can send them proud for 20 miles away and distance them from the voice of God. They don't even know. And they share. They say, wow. Really? Do you know that you minister? Let me tell you. Every seed produces after its own kind. Not the other way around. There's a qualification of faithfulness to whom men are entrusted with certain words. 
You don't go on the internet and find a certain devotion and copy it and just paste it and you think you're ministering to people. There is more responsibility to that. Because you don't know the spirit under which the man wrote. That's why they just sing songs here. They're amazing. Then they cry a bit and then they walk away. Because they're just songs. They don't minister to the lives of men. And how big now when they get to mature men who are seeking impartation, you can sense that there is a spirit of confusion on them. Yes, they are ministering what seems right, but they are not ministering truth. They are not even ministering. They are making a fair show in the flesh. To bring men to a certain place of thinking that they know. They do not know anything. Get them in the day of adversity. Their strength is small. Something hits them once, boom, and they respond like babies. And then you're surprised. Oh, so this one was sharing a mystery on Facebook. How funny. How funny. How? Even you people who submit also have some wisdom. Let me also get on your bit. Have some wisdom. Have some wisdom. Don't just wake up. Ah, oh, spiritual mother. Ah, oh, spiritual mother. You just <laughs> have some wisdom. Have a little wisdom. Have a little wisdom. What mantle has cast on you? You know, do you know, and this is the funny thing about many people. And you watch the biggest number of people who have hit shipwreck are the people who have repeated this word most, the Lord spoke to me. Do you know how many mistakes Christians have done in the name of God told me? Many Christians. They're hitting shipwreck every day. They're saying the Lord told me. You look at their lives and you realize really the Lord did not tell them. The Lord did not tell them. The Lord did not tell them. There was a very prominent man of God one time. He said the Lord had told him that he was supposed to say something big in a certain minister and the Lord would, you know, quicken his footsteps. And he did. And I went to Pastor Isaiah that evening and I said, this man of God has shown this to a certain man of God. And I told him, Pastor, what do you think? Like my father. He said, that has been his end. And from that day, we saw him lose everything. And that minister is living hungry. But he's too convinced the Lord spoke to him. I ask Christians, how far are you going to go with God speaking to you? Can God speak to you and you put on the way you put on, and you eat the way you eat, and you sleep the way you sleep? Now you have heard the voice of God. You're lying. You're lying. No man has heard God. Read the Bible. Elijah, Jeremiah, Abraham, Zephaniah. Read the Bible. No man ever read met God and had his voice where he was. But you, you're not even advancing anywhere and you're claiming you're hearing God. The Lord led me to start this. The Lord led me to do this. The Lord led me to do this. <sighs> How be it that you've met the Lord and you're still the same? Which man meets God and is the same? Tell me one in the Bible before you show me anyone in the world. Show me one in the Bible who has met God and is the same. They're just looking at a dear boy with a spiritual father. He can't even type with a spiritual father. What seed are you producing? What seed are you producing? You can't even type. I'm sorry. May I have the authority I'm put on by the call of God upon my life? You can try to copy me and fail. And never copy me the way I preach. I promise. People will hate you. Me, they can't. Listen. <laughs> I found a little guy. Listen. I found a little guy with a spiritual father. I go through the guy's not he doesn't even type. But he's also fathering. Since he started working, his priest has never seen his first fruit. But he's also a spiritual father. Spiritual father. She just woke up one day and then got excited. And people say, I'm a mama, I'm a mama. Someone annoyed her in the choir. She stayed away for four months. She never came back for four months. She's away from church for four months. And then she comes back, and my mama. And then one time I'm hearing, boo, someone up there, but they are meeting their spiritual children outside church, but they are counseling him. You could not even stand chastisement. And you're chastising. Your mother. Your mama. Your spiritual mama. Spiritual mama. Really? 
And you can't even have the, the audacity to say, I think I'm not fit for this. You just accept and also lay hands on your children. I saw this happen in my life of ministry. Someone is rebuked by their father one day and they drive there can never come back for five months. Why? I was hurt. Oh, that they even though they do chastisement. That means they're not children, they're bastards. And that bastard tomorrow is a spiritual mother. But she's also raising faith. How can she raise you? How? Under which authority? When the Bible speaks of them that have a testimony among us them that are without, that's the mothering spirit. That's the fathering spirit. What testimony have you seen in this little woman to be a spiritual mother? What have you seen in this little guy to say he's your spiritual father? Listen, don't get me wrong here. Spiritual fathering is not age. Spiritual fathering is responsibility. Number one, when you say you're a spiritual father, you ought to have the ardent responsibility of fathering. Because fathering is not leadership and controlling people and having authority over men. Least you forget that you're seated under a man who casts his glory on you. And that is why you see very many men in that kind of distinguishment. Even when they're in ministry, they're not building another man's vision. They're building their own glory. They're building their own ministry. Even when he's preaching, he's not preaching with a pure understanding of any man articulating from the Spirit, speaking Rema. He's speaking with the authority to get as many children. He's speaking with authority to build his own car kingdom and empire. Until a particular day he can walk out and have a certain following and start his own ministry. And that is why they stayed around you. Now to now. He is half vexed, and the next thing you know, we're starting a ministry. What is he going to minister? Who released him? Who released him? Under whose garment was he anointed? Whose garment did he receive consecration? Because the lines of consecration is having the same mind. How can you be consecrated under a man whose mind you don't share? How can I consecrate you when we don't share the same mind? What made me lose appetite? That doesn't make you lose appetite. What made me lose sleep? That make you lose sleep. What made me pray? That make you pray. What made me attend? That make you attend. What made me carry bricks to preach the gospel? That make you carry bricks to preach the gospel. What made me spend all my money in the gospel? Cannot make you even spend a tithe on it. And you're saying you're going to do ministry. Which ministry? You shouldn't even lead brethren in prayer. You shouldn't. How can you lead men to a place you have not been? And the next thing I know, they were already self-appointed. They appoint themselves to do things that are spiritual. Listen, when the priest was mandated to go and offer sacrifices, I know you enter there. You shall be leprosy and die. Because it's responsibility. It's a call of God upon the man's life. He has the grace to do those things. Don't try to steal laurels because you have a little gift on you that can appeal certain numbers. That is not fathering. Spiritual mother, spiritual father. What do you mean by spiritual father? When was the last time you talked to your own father, spiritual father? You've never even considered the end of the man who you submit to. You don't even know whether you profit to them. Because you don't even have the humility to ask, rank me father, rank me. You don't have that ability to ask. And now, what does the Bible say in Hebrews 13? Obey them that have the rule over you. Submit yourselves wholly. Are you hearing me? With all gravity for submission. He says, for if you do this, you become profitable. So they are not profitable because they don't even submit. They don't account. Now, how, if you do not account, you wake up in the morning and don't pray. You don't even expect, you don't even explain where you were. And you're also fathering. You are... You're seeking accountability of who you don't account to. Can I wake up in the morning and just stay home and don't tell Pastor Isaiah anything? And still come and claim I'm Apostle Michael's spiritual father? That's why the Bible says, weigh yourself to see where are you in the faith. Fathering is not authority and receiving from men. Fathering is giving your life. Fathering is being there when they need you. Fathering is standing them when they're irrit irritable. They are laughing and acting, they are annoying and irritating every day, but you love them because you're their father. You leave the example they don't leave. You get mad with them, but you love them the next day. Why? Because they are your seed. You're producing your own kind in them. But the same way they used to think four years ago, they're thinking the same way today. You have failed. 
And that seed is scattered. And the next thing you know, you realize under the man's seed, there are certain lines that are just not right. They're just not right. Why? He sowed a certain seed. And he's sowing a certain seed every day. And then he says, oh God, why aren't I breaking through? Why aren't I breaking through? Why aren't I breaking through? And I made, like, like one time I told Pastor John, I told you, Pastor John, me, I will never allow. You see these men who stand on the pulpit. I study their lives. And I'm very serious. Those are things of being funny. No. No. Because these are lives we are responsible for. As a man of God, if you don't tithe, you, what are you teaching? You, what are you teaching? What are you teaching? If you go in the back and speak about your father, what are you teaching? What are you planting? Now, if you're not accountable, why do you seek accountability? Except you have Jezebel on you. That's Jezebel. Where yourself? Are you accountable enough to put another man to accountability? If you're not accountable enough to put another man to accountability, go back and learn how they account. And you can't wake up in the morning and not even sleep accounting. I am sorry, I won't make it on Sunday. You can't. Some even take a certain authority of informing where they should have asked for permission. I'm just informing you, Papa, that I will be away. And many of those, you know, I do, I say, okay. I just say, okay. Because in this particular time, we don't have a place to tell them this kind of going away requires permission. This one you can go when you want, but this kind requires permission. No, they are just informing. This is me, what I do is I stay in the informed mode. I say, okay, thank you for informing me. And I carry on. And then after two days, he says, I am Christian. Papa, how is it that I'm not seeing changes in my life? And for some of those people, I don't have much to tell them. I just tell them, refer to my sermon. If one day per adventure they are wise, they'll stumble on this one. If they're not wise, let them continue that way. As I told people, sometimes even when you have 5,000 or a million people following you, get 7 or 10 guys or 12 and put something in them. That's what I want to do. Because I've realized sometimes we are wasting time and breaking time on people who will never learn. They will never. Because we've repeated certain things so long to see certain things happen in their life. It's a surprise. But after three years of submitting to this ministry, you're still doing certain things. Still doing. That I found someone, which is a spiritual mama, then they're not attending service. I asked them, where were you during service? I was busy preaching in a certain school. I said, hey, but I don't see you on Sundays. He says, yeah, Papa, every Sunday I'm preaching in a certain school. I said, okay, so you think you're too mature enough to go preaching in a school? To attend service? You think you're that mature? Okay, go and preach your sermon in those schools. Let me watch you after 10 years and we see whether you'll be preaching in those schools. Men don't know in a time when they ought to be putting in order the things that are wanting before they are really appointed for the mandate. They are already making themselves busy because they think that Jesus was stupid to study for 30 years and do a three-year ministry. Jesus Christ. Sometimes all we needed was to put something inside you enough that if that thing settles, even in one month, you'll go up. One month like this, you'll go up. But you want to take a longer line of doing it 20 years, like some men. That your successes in 20 are going to be another man's successes in three weeks. And you're going to be comfortable. Spiritual mama. You're going for your children's sake. She's like Kimberly holding a baby. My niece Kimberly, she has this doll. My God, baby eat, baby drink. Kimberly is attending to doll. She doesn't know that this is not a child. She thinks it's a real baby. She cries, puts it on the back, then walks. And then after that, she feeds it. The next thing you know, she's covering her baby. She can be there. She's watching. She says, oh, my baby, my baby. Then she goes in the bedroom. She picks my baby. She can go, baby, 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 mommy, baby, guy, baby, guy. Two years before she thinks she's holding a baby. Kumbe, she has a doll. 
some Christians are like that. They're holding dolls and they think they're papas. They think they're mamas. Now you see lines of submission. They've changed from being spiritual. They've become ignorant. And inexcusable lines and reasons of division. Reasons of division. Not really that they are really able to sustain the lives of men and account to God about these men. But you're dealing with lives. If they lose their life, you're accountable. You're accountable. You're accountable. No, I had God. There's a man today I was talking with. And he reminded me of a certain guy we used to minister with. I don't forget that this man always said the Lord told him. Until over the years, the Spirit of the Lord clearly reveals to me the man just has a controlling spirit on him. When somebody has that Jezebelic spirit on them, they will hear God every time. They will be having a prophecy for you every minute. Some of you have met such people. Oh, the Lord has told me this. Oh, the Lord. Let me tell you, God speaks to us. God speaks to us. I'll give you an example. Two weeks ago, somebody reported someone to me. And my children know that. So me, so and so did this. I said, eh, let me call them now. I didn't call them. For two weeks, I'm quiet. For two weeks, I'm quiet. Because when they spoke, I heard from the Spirit that this person who reported has an issue. Not the one they reported, even though the one who reported is wrong. You see, someone can be wrong. Are you hearing me? But the person reporting is not true. They are factual. But they are not true. Because reports come from truth. I tell people, I hear, therefore I judge. If I have not heard anything about a man, even if he has killed and I've seen him kill, I have not heard enough to judge him. Then you ask, but why is this? Is he, is he promoting sin? I am not promoting sin. I have not heard to judge him. And that's why many of you realize that my judgment I just one day, I just wake up one day and I'm done. I don't have processes. I just wake up one day and I'm saying, you know what, you hand over this. I don't want to see you do that. And that's it. You don't hear me explain, ah, la, 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 la. no. It's not a line of explaining. I had, hand over, get on, move on, do your own business, let anybody else come and do it. Why? Because at the end of the day, this man is judged. When as a campus, no, not really campus. Yes, campus. There was this girl the Lord spoke to me about one time, many times a company. And she was very anointed. I mean very anointed. So it was during those times we prophesied, but every time I went to this woman to pray for her, the Spirit would tell me, don't touch her. I said, but Jesus, you love enough not to reject. And I was disturbed because in all my time of starting ministry, I had never had the Holy Spirit intentionally tell me, don't touch a person. Now, when the Bible says, do not hastily lay hands, I understand. It means, don't just think that everyone in this world has to have their hand on you, or you have to have their hand on them. Or that if you don't lay hands on them, they won't go. Grow. Or that you must lay hands on them. You get it? So I insist to God. And then it starts to be a battle between me wanting to release this woman into something, and the Lord saying, no. Don't lay hands on her. And it took months and months and months and months and months until we left campus. And I failed to lay hands on that woman. And then years later I asked the Lord, why couldn't I lay hands on that woman? And the Spirit of the Lord told me, she despised you. She did. <laughs> what? She seemed humble. No, no, no. She despised you. I mean, she despised you, she despised me. I said, oh, is that so? I said, yes. And the Spirit of the Lord told me, watch her life. I'm still watching. She has not moved an inch from campus. 
How many years have you been from campus? She has not moved an inch. An inch. Because Timothy, sometimes all you need was a prophecy spoken on you by the laying on of her hands. He says, by them shall you wage a good war. There are those words that will come in your life, Timothy, and something will deliver you because a certain man laid a hand on you someday. But that grace is not on this dear woman. Now, she can go and seek God, claim grace, low faith, whatever. Let her pray. She despised God. She despised God. She despised God. Simple instruction. Listen, God died and used trees. God died and used water. He uses men. He uses men. And he's not stupid to use men. Or share his glory with a man. I don't know whether any of you have ever read the story between Howard Cat and Lester Sumero. Howard Carter and Lester Sumero. Howard Carter was a very gifted prophet. Very gifted prophet. Now he was a man established in his day like deep like never. He was very deep. Howard Carter was very deep. Lester Sumero was just this young little prophet coming up in the things of the spirit. And one time, <laughs> the Lord speaks to Lester Sumero that if you follow that man, I will make you what I promised to make you. Imagine, simple instruction, follow him. Now Lester could be proud and say, but Jesus have God. I'm also anointed. I have the Holy Ghost on me. I have the word and the promises of God spoken upon my life. Just follow him. Follow that man. And one day as he follows Howard Carter, Howard Carter tells him the very word and tells him, the Lord has told me you're going to move with me. And Howard Carter moves with Lester. Lester served Howard Carter until he died. When Lester Sumero started ministry, when Lester Sumero started ministry, you could realize that he entered another man's labors. There was a grace of Lester that was just a blessing toward Howard. Like you'd see that the children of Abraham would enjoy a promise that was made to Abraham. Listen, when he says, when he speaks, look at, look at, for example, that financial life, okay? where he says that he shall make you prosperous, okay? And the Bible says and that he might establish the covenant that he made to your forefathers. Then a certain kind of wealth line comes to you, not because you're a hard worker or you're a tither, but there is something he promised his holy man. I don't know if you understand what I'm trying to There is something he promised that man, and he told him your seed shall inherit this. He knew that the blessing he was giving you. You understand what I'm trying to tell you? He says, but thou shalt remember the Lord God, for he is that giveth thee power to make wealth. The word power is dynamic, the anointing. That he may establish his covenant with my father, as it is this day. And then a silly guy wakes up and says, me, I don't have a father, a spirit. There is something he wants to establish upon your life because he promised your man of God that he would. This is deeper than whether you pray or you fast or you don't fast. This one, he promised it to the man. He told him, your seed shall not lack. And then the blessing starts to start. And then this kid says, no, he's not my father. Me, my father is the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Praise the Lord Jesus. Praise the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. And I realized one thing. They don't know what was cast on them. And man of God, when you meet men who don't know what was cast on them, look for those who know what was cast on them. Period. Look for a man who honors the anointing upon your life enough to fear the end of your conversation. If you tell them, do this, and you see they are obeying, like you've told them, minister to that one. Give them more time than the one who gives you headaches. And some men of God are funny. They leave men who are obedient and waste time with bastards. But they are claiming that they are their children. And they are in, they pierce themselves with many sorrows. He will have mercy to whom he chooses to have mercy to. That's how God thinks. Are you hearing me? If I tell Prosy I need you at church at 5 and Prosy comes at 5, mark you. 
I will put more time on prostitute. Because she honors the glory upon my life. She honors the instruction that comes from my mouth. And I tell another one, come tomorrow. Then they don't come. They don't even give an explanation. That one I know they don't honor the anointing upon my life. They don't. They don't. Don't chuck them. Don't throw them away. No. Give more time to the man who hits. Invest more time to the man who hits. Because whether you want it or not, they will ask for the mantle. They will ask for what's upon your life. And the moment they ask for it, don't put what's upon your life. Ask them what they really want. Because maybe they've seen more than you've seen. Don't be jealous to believe it. That's fathering. Some people are even in bad books of their fathers and their father. <laughs> and I'm like, never now. Think by producing a child, you're a father. No, you're just a man. It's sperm. With enough seed. You just have enough revelations to throw them on the pulpit and people say, hey, I think this is my spiritual father because he speaks certain deep things. But you've not walked that life. You have not walked that life. The lives of men need a certain attention that you can't give. Tell your neighbor, grow up. Of course, in such someone, I don't expect clapping. I don't expect the man. Experience the mystery of the word, the redemptive power revelation, and eternity purpose brought to light in your walk with Christ. You can reach us on mobile plus 256-704-150042 or our website www.christheart.org. Our email address is hocmessages at gmail.com. That is hocmessages at gmail.com.